These guys are freaky looking. Wait till you see my cousin Allie. Hey! Grandpa studied dino bones. Sam and Allie love just what he did. Oh! They really took his work. Hunting on the internet for all the dino stories they could get. Sam thought of a plan, got a show on a cable station About dinosaur digs, what scientists think They're piecing it together Bonehead, detectives of the paleo world Bonehead, detectives of the paleo world Okay, Eddie, whenever you're ready. Uh, uh Sam, I, I think we're on. On the air? Yeah. Hey, how's it going? I'm Allie, and he's my cousin, Sam. We've been into dinosaurs forever. Our grandpa was a famous paleontologist and actually knew the dinosaurs personally. You know, back when they ruled the world. And if you ask us, dinosaurs still rule the world. They may be extinct, but the bones they left behind are clues to some amazing mysteries. And thanks to Allie's contacts on the web, we have some of the most famous boneheads in the world working with us. They're like our detectives in the field, and they know everything, so basically, we rule. No doubt about that. Today, we're opening the file on some of the strangest looking dinosaurs of them all. Just wait till you see their heads. Pachycephalosaurus, for instance, also known as the Bonehead. Awesome nickname. The question is, why such a bony head? Even better question. Why the strange resemblance to my computer teacher, Mr. Bugler? Well, that we may never know. But there are a few theories about the Pachycephalosaurus, as you and Al see. Wait a minute. I wanted to press play. Sorry. I'll press it next time. Our search begins here, in South Dakota. Wait, this is South Dakota? Sure, in the good old days. And these are the South Dakotans. They had it pretty good for a while. This part of the country was lush and tropical back then. Now for the bad news. About 65 million years ago, all the South Dakota dinosaurs suddenly died off. May they rest in peace. Of course, that turned out to be good news for the bone diggers of the world. Welcome to Sandy's site, 20th Century Fossil Museum. This area is jam-packed with millions of fossilized plants and animals. In fact, this is where the first Tyrannosaurus and Triceratops were found. It's also known as Hell Creek. That doesn't scare this guy. Yeah, the devil. No, actually, it's bone hunter Mike Trebolt. He's got the top down, the wind in his hair, and his eye peeled for fossils. Sweet guard. Sandy's site is one of the richest fossil beds in the world. And you can see there's plenty of parking. Even though dinosaur bones have been found from Africa to Argentina, Sandy's site is something really different. Just ask Mike. One of the things I enjoy so much about the Sandy site is not only is this where the dinosaurs lived 66 million years ago, but this is the exact place where they died. Basically, what Mike and his team do here is dig in the dirt but they've got to know where to look. The sandy site itself is contained within this region right here. This sand above is virtually barren. This clay cap contains millions upon millions of plant fossils. And virtually all the bones are found from here to the clay base that I'm, that I'm sitting on. This is the tibia of a small carnivorous dinosaur still in the ground. And what makes it extremely difficult here at the sandy site is the fact that not only are these bones not very fossilized, but they're also in damp ground. And so what we have to do is cut around the bone and not actually get to it. And we won't actually know what kind of dinosaur this was until it's been prepared in the lab. Mike spent over two years digging for Pachycephalosaurus bones. Two years? There's a skull right there! I could have saved him so much time, but no one listens to me. Even though dino detectives had known about bonehead skulls for years, before Mike Trebold came along, no one had ever seen what their bodies looked like. And what a body. 
At the site, the skull wasn't intact. It was blown apart like an exploded view. As an example, this particular knob right here, this spike, was all by itself. A few inches over, we found another little spike. And then another piece a few inches later. And all of this was scattered in the matrix. And it wasn't until we were in the lab preparing and preserving these pieces and then discovering that they did indeed fit together that we realized at that time that it was a pachycephalosaur of some kind. This is a weird creature, previously known only from the domes of the skull. With this discovery, we have the skull and its skeleton, which gives us an opportunity to look at what was really going on. Let's dig up some more dirt on our good buddies, the boneheads. Can't we get some historical perspective on these hard-headed guys? You want perspective? I've got tons of perspective. Let's take a look at my timeline. Huh, it's about time. There's always time for a timeline, time per minute. Hey, <laughs> pretty punny. And timely. <laughs> Okay, that's Allie over there on the right, in the present. Now let's find something we think of as really old, like the pyramids. But that's only 4,000 years ago. The first caveman didn't show up until 2 million years ago. And that's nothing compared to when the dinosaurs lived. The boneheads appeared about 130 million years ago. And they pretty much lived life to the fullest until the end of the Cretaceous period about 65 million years ago. So now that Mike Trebold has enlightened us with his reconstruction of the most complete pachycephalosaurus skeleton ever assembled, we can finally ask the question, what is the deal with that head? Well now, Sam, back in the 1800s, when the bonehead skulls were first found, they thought that these dinosaurs needed extra big heads to hold their extra big brains. That sounds like an old idea. Oh, it is. Then forget about it! Let's find out what the bonehead experts are saying. This is my man, Bob Bakker, and he asked the question... Boneheads. Why? When the first boneheaded dinosaur was found the last century, it was clear they weren't nearly as bright as their domed forehead would indicate. This dome was not full of brains, it was full of solid bone. Mm -hmm. Why? A very old idea was... These animals had outlived their Darwinian clock. They're revolving every which way, sprouting bumps and tchotchkes and thingamabigs and domed heads for no reason at all. That's an old idea, and it's a bunk. In fact, this small-brained, armored, four-headed dinosaur was a beautifully designed fighting machine. I love Allie! Hey, look, they're fighting over you! Like, I would date a split end. Uh, no, that's a quarterback. Oh. He's going for a touchdown! He could make it, folks! Oh. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This helmet isn't enough to really protect this delicate box. If you want to tackle with your helmet, you got to lose the brains which is exactly what this dinosaur did. It's got a dome up here, but there are virtually no brains. The dome is solid bone. Wait, is Bakker saying that football players don't have any brains? Uh, that could get him in some trouble after the game. I think Bob can take care of himself. And all he's really saying is that if you take a look at that solid dome bonehead, you can't help but think football helmet. Ouch. And it's a widely held theory that the Boneheads had these violent headbutting contests to scare off rivals and predators. I don't know. It seems like an awful big leap from football player to Pachycephalosaurus. Well, it's not just football players. There are a lot of animals today who do the same kind of thing. Look at these guys. See? They butt heads too. And these rams. Same thing. All right. Football players are not the only animals that butt heads. But we still don't know exactly why they did it. Here we are at the Smithsonian, and this guy here is Paleo Detective Ralph Chapman. Looks like Ralph's working on some bonehead skulls, too. Good eye. Ralph took a careful look at a bunch of packy skulls, and believe it or not, he thinks that they were knocking themselves out in the name of love. If the dome of pachycephalosaurs was used primarily for defense against predators, you would expect the domes of the females to be the same shape as the dome of the males, because both need to avoid getting eaten by those predators. 
the alternative that the dome was used in sexual combat, such as front butting or butting of the flank, you would make a prediction that the dome of the males would be much better developed dome relative to the female, which has a smaller, flatter dome. In our analyses, the results show exactly that. Males would have the bigger domes because in nature, they would be the ones to fight over becoming top dog to have the right to mate with the females. And besides, males are the only ones dumb enough to do this kind of behavior. Now, back in his laboratory, our old friend Mike Trebold has been working on his own theory. He questions the whole idea of headbutting. This discovery has answered several questions about whether or not pachycephalosaurs could butt heads or not. As you can see, the skull is very large in comparison to the size of the neck vertebrae. And the neck vertebrae also have a very strong natural curve. And as you can see in this model that I have here, in its natural articulation, everything is fine, but when you try to straighten the neck to ram the skull, you dislocate the vertebrae. And they simply could not do that. Mark Goodwin agrees with Treble. Headbutting just doesn't make sense, especially if you're taking a pack of cephalosaurus to the bowling alley. A bowling alley? Headbutting is a popular theory. It, it's in all the dinosaur books. I don't think it happened. I don't think they're capable of doing it. And I'd like to change that idea. The surface of a bowling ball is very much like the surface of a pachycephalosaur skull, both big and very round. When you have two pachycephalosaurs colliding together, they have to be lined up perfectly in order to make contact. If they're not, they'll glance off each other. This is when we have serious problems. This would result in injury to the animals and perhaps death. I still don't buy it. Why would the packy skulls be so thick if they didn't butt heads? They may look thick to you, but Mark put that skull under a microscope. And guess what he saw? Paleontologists have described the domes of pachycephalosaurs as being solid bone. In fact, they feel and sound very solid. But when you look at these skulls under a microscope, you see a much different structure. In fact, what you see is a honeycomb structure of bone. It's full of holes, just like the theory of headbutting. Well, if the helmet theory doesn't fit, and the Packies did butt heads, then why did they have, to quote Bob Bakker, bumps and tchotchkes and thingamabigs? Look, this bone was definitely made for ramming into something. Thank you. I don't see them lining up 100 meters apart and charging at each other. Instead, I see them headbutting from close up and wrestling until one of them gets a headache and just gives up. This isn't for head-to-head -head ramming. With a head like this, you want to aim into your opponent's chest. Better yet, a blunt disabling blow to the stomach. Like this. And this. Uh, all right, I think these guys are uh, getting tired. Let's move on. All right. Well, here comes Peter Dotson, yet another paleontologist with his own theory about a different kind of dueling dinosaur. But instead of going to football practice, he likes to hang out at the gym. <laughs> Yet another sports analogy. Dotson watches the heavyweight sparring in the ring to get an idea of how male triceratops would battle for the attention of the female. A bull triceratops comes out of the forest into a clearing and looks across the clearing and sees another bull at the other end of the, the clearing. He's not happy with the sight. He rocks his head side to side, he stomps his foot, lifts his legs, he urinates, puts his scent around the ground, he tosses his head to the sides and discovers that the uh, clearing is filling with females coming to watch the struggle, listening to the sounds and sights. And he dips his head more and he rolls his head side to side and he is really furious now. And finally, all out of breath, our animal fails. He lowers his head, he disengages, he's beaten, he backs off, he backs off, he backs off, and finally he turns and slinks off into the dark forest gloom. Oh, poor thing. Oh, you're such a sucker. Oh! And the skull rattling continues. Watch, this one's my favorite. Ugh. 
Well, now at least I think we can agree that headbutting did not die out with the dinosaurs. You're right. I mean, everywhere you turn, you see animals sparring and jousting to be top guy in the herd. It doesn't matter if you're a giraffe or a triceratops. That's bonehead detective Phil Curry. He and his team are in Alberta, Canada, where they're digging up even more information about the habits of that three-horned headbutter, Triceratops. This is where Phil found a bone bed full of Triceratops fossils. He's trying to get a fresh angle on the mystery of Dinosaur Park. Why did so many Triceratops die here? The original bone bed is about half the size of a football field, and it extends in basically one layer through this hill, across a saddle region, through another hill, um, there are literally thousands or maybe even millions of bones in this bone bed. And finding so many triceratops all in the same place makes Phil think they had more in common with these buffalo than just the horns on their heads. Like, if all these millions of buffalo were triceratops, whoa, that's kind of freaky. If you think that's freaky, imagine if a whole herd of them got wiped out all at once. Phil's working in a triceratops graveyard. We discounted the majority of uh, scenarios that we came up with for various reasons and came up with the idea that there had to have been a mass death, that these animals uh, were in fact animals that were moving together and encountered some kind of a catastrophe. Catastrophe? Like what? A flood? Maybe. It could have been a flood. What? Was it disease? Possibly. What, a volcano erupted? Something like that? Mm, might have been. Well, which one was it? You don't even know, do you? It's still up in the air. No one knows exactly what happened over 60 million years ago, Sam. But Dave Ebert's a geologist. Questions about the ancient past are his specialty. Uh, a geologist? Uh, what's he going to contribute? As a geologist, what I'm able to contribute is a sense of time and a sense of place to the study. Time in the sense that uh, the rock record that we have in Dinosaur Park comprises over two million years worth of time. A sense of place in the sense that I'm able to tell the paleontologists what the environments were like and what the processes were like during the life and deaths of these animals. All right, bonehead rock star Dave knows his stuff, but my friend Jack does most of the real work. Jack? Jack. Hammer. <laughs> good one. What's a dino dig without a good power tool joke? We're lucky you've got the humor angle covered. That leaves Dave free to tell us about the history of the area. Dinosaur Park, during the late Cretaceous, about 77 to 76 million years ago, was a lowland coastal plain. If you think of the northern reaches of Florida, southern Georgia, even into Louisiana, you've got the right visual model. Very swampy, some areas of dense forest, but essentially a very swampy, thickly green, lush, wet lowland subject to small changes in sea level and very sensitive to storm winds. The migrating Triceratops probably never planned on staying here, but they didn't check the weather forecast. The storm surges and swells would force the rivers that were already swollen to overtop their banks and flood out the entire coast plain. Once that started happening, it was just a matter of time before the large animals would essentially bite it. Here's a quick flashback 70 million years or so to Dinosaur Park. This is how the story ended for this herd of Triceratops. But the story isn't over yet. Millions of years have passed, but not that much has changed in the lives of herd animals. For Triceratops and wildebeest alike, danger may hide behind every bend in the river. One day they find strength in their great numbers, and the next day may be their last. Meanwhile, back in the boneyards... We've got one last head case on the menu. I should warn viewers, though. Its appearance is a little shocking and may frighten younger children. Viewer discretion is advised. It's not that bad. Here, let me find it. Here's an example of Parasaurolophus in its native habitat. Bonehead Dave Weishample thinks this animal's horn was instrumental in its quest for mate. The crest itself is very, very fragile. It's built out of very thin bone. Probably couldn't withstand a lot of this head-to-head -head stuff like you see in bighorn sheep. So if it wasn't for headbutting, then what good was it? What else would it be for? It was a big mystery at first. 
There was no shortage of theories, though. Some people even thought it was a snorkel. Uh, I'll buy the snorkel theory. Well, put your money away, Sam. Swedish scientist Carl Wiemann figured it all out. Carl Wiemann in Uppsala got himself a duckbill dinosaur with a hollow crest. He looked at it and said, it looks like a trombone. It was a trombone. It was for making loud courtship noises. This is what the musical Parasaurolophus skull looks like on the inside. And this is how he called his girlfriend. He would expel air through his nasal passages. The air reverberated through the hollow chambers inside the horn. Voila, the world's first trombone. Weird. How did it sound? Dave Weishample thinks he knows. Well, this contraption that I've got in my hands here is, in fact, a model of the crest of Parasaurolophus. It's the right size and the right shape for Parasaurolophus. It's built out of PVC tubing. And the reason I built it was to get a better sense as to the kinds of sound that Parasaurolophus would have made. So why don't I play it for you? Ah. Uh. Sounds of Saturday night in the Cretaceous. Oh, and love is in the air. So you're telling me that's really the sound of Parasaurolophus out tooting his horn, trying to get a date? If you listen to the experts. No wonder they're extinct. So there you have it, Allie. The case we like to call the mystery of the crazy Cretaceous cranium. Pachycephalosaurus, Triceratops, and Parasaurolophus. As we found out today, although they looked bizarre, their skulls served a purpose. Yeah, you know, whether it was uh, cracking heads or uh, getting the girl. <laughs> These guys really had it going on upstairs. And we covered a lot of ground today. Of course we did. A good detective leaves no stone unturned. Unless it's really heavy. Yeah, but then we just have to break out Mr. Jackson T. Hammer, right? What? You know, Jackson T. Hammer. <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah, there you go. Hey. Good news! We're going on an African bone hunt. That means thousands of miles of blistering sun and sand. Did I say good news? One, two, three, four! Grandpa studied dino bones. Sam and Allie loved just what he did. Oh, they really dug his work. Hunting on the internet. For all the dino stories they could get Oh, they really taught their work Allie and Sam thought of a plan Got a show on the cable station About dinosaur digs What scientists think They're piecing it together Bonehead Detectives of the paleo world Finally. Sorry, Allie. You do remember we're doing a show here? Yes, I know. Uh, hey, everyone. Where were you, Sam? Sorry, I had to run by my friend Zach's house to pick up this shovel. It took me so long to find it because his garage is such a mess. But now I'm here and ready to dig. Uh, Sam, we're not actually going on the dig. We're just watching here from the studio. I know that. I'm using it as a visual aid. <sighs> Alrighty then, let's get digging. Today we're going to follow famous paleontologist Paul Serino and his crew on a fossil hunt in the Sahara Desert. I can dig it, as my dad would say, but what I'm really stoked about is that we get to follow this case from beginning to end. That's right, we'll see how real bonehead detectives crack a case. And we'll answer the key question. What goes into a successful dig? Well, you need a good shovel. Right, but what about a good team that sticks together? Looking for bones in the world's biggest sandbox can be incredibly frustrating. Yeah, but not as frustrating as trying to find this shovel in Zach's garage. You know, if I hadn't tripped over his dad's saxophone case, I would never have found this thing. Well, that's exactly like bone hunting, Sam. What? Tripping over somebody's saxophone case? No, some of the most amazing scientific discoveries depend on... dumb luck. You'll see. Ah, uh, not so fast, late boy. She who was on time shall press play. Oh, right, the beach. Not quite, Sam. This is the Sahara Desert in northern Africa. It's the biggest desert in the world. The Sahara is three million square miles of the harshest sandscape on Earth. 
Plus, not a lot of fossils have been found here, so most boneheads stay away. Because the African continent is still so unexplored, its mysteries have been irresistible to boneheads throughout history. In 1914, German paleontologists found evidence of a creature they called Spinosaurus. Unfortunately, these fossils were destroyed in a bombing raid in World War II. A few years later, French bonehead René Lavocat hopped aboard a camel and hoofed it through the sands of Morocco, where he found further evidence of dinosaurs in Africa. Then, in 1990, American paleo detective Paul Serino came to the Sahara and made a huge discovery. So huge, it made headlines. He found an entirely new kind of dinosaur. He named it Afrovenator, meaning African hunter. Here's a picture of it chopping Paul's head in two. And now that old rebel Paul is returning to the desert. I've always been a, a rebel without a cause as a kid. I found a cause now that causes um, unearthing uh, really whole new chapters of uh, dinosaur life in Africa. So Paul put together his team in Chicago for the biggest bone hunting expedition ever to go to Africa. They flew to England where he got these cool land rovers. Then they drove through France and Spain. It's not exactly a short drive to Africa. And it was going to be an even longer stay, about two months. So Paul had to make sure he had the right people for the job. Not only did they need experience, but they had to be able to work well together. And they had to know how to party together, too. To a reasonably complete sauropod with a skull. But not too heavy, with no ribs. We have um, Gabriel Lyon, or Gabe. They call me Myasaurus, which means good mother. And so if I need to discipline them, it's not a problem. <laughs> then we have Hans Larsen, variously known as... Uh, what? Solo. 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 <laughs> Solo, who is a paleontologist. He also uh, is handling the vehicles and uh, lots of other things and, and, and is very interested in, 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 in helping describe and find the dinosaurs. Didier Dutai, French paleontologist, generally goes by the title of ambassador because uh, he, uh, he manages all complicated affairs. <laughs> Jeff Wilson, who is our sauropod, the big dinosaur expert, who would love probably more than anyone else for us to find one of these huge, huge beasts. Did we already toast to that? Let's toast <laughs> Why not? Sauropod. Isn't that a good... Now that's what I call a serious paleo party. Well, they better live it up, because once they get to the desert, there won't be any of life's luxuries. Yeah, and there might not even be any fossils. You're right. I mean, even though they think the bones are there, there's no guarantee. And even if they are there, finding them won't be easy. Yeah, but Paul has a hunch they will, and he's willing to bet his paleo reputation on it. I hope he's right. We're back on the road to Morocco and full of hope. It took 11 more days for Serena's team to finally cross into Africa. Their first stop is the Moroccan port city of Tangiers. Well, I guess there's no turning back now. Next stop is the medieval city of Fez. As you can see, they got an early start on the day. And they're not the only ones. Those are the sounds of Muslims at their morning prayers. That's a sound you probably won't hear in Chicago. And here's something you won't see. Check out what a Moroccan mall looks like. All prices are negotiable, but if you want a bargain, you've got to speak French. Monsieur, combien pour litre? Uh, pour kilo. Kilo. Pour kilo? No, no. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Gramme, nice. yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's the price. <laughs> Ça, le price. Excusez-moi, how much do you charge for the giant pile de cinnamon? So it's 15 per kilo. That's not bad. With all the supplies packed up, the team headed for the desert. Africa has always been the least explored part of the world when it comes to fossil hunting. With the blazing hot sun beating down on endless stretches of sand, most boneheads have stayed away, but Serino and his team love a challenge. Not to mention a good mystery, and the Sahara is pretty much the mystery capital of the world. Let's see what the sands of time reveal today. Sounds like it's time for one of your snazzy timelines. One timeline coming up extra snazz. This is the time period Paul's into. It's called the Mesozoic. That's when the dinosaurs ruled supreme. But the part of the Mesozoic that really rattles his bones is the Cretaceous. Why? Because that's when the African dinos started coming on strong. And that's because they were cut off from their relatives in the rest of the world. Why's that, you ask? 
Because for the first hundred million years or so of the dinosaur era, all the continents in the world were blobbed together into one big mega blob called Pangaea. Then, about 150 million years ago, the mega blobs started to split apart into a number of mini blobs. Some boneheads think the dinos started evolving differently in different parts of the world. And so we have the idea that uh, possibly on different islands, continents, uh, whole different kinds of animals came into being. It looks like at least the predators and possibly the herbivores had gone off on their own. And uh, how different and bizarre these animals are is what we're really trying to narrow down. How did the isolation at a continent level affect dinosaur evolution? We think something different was happening here. To try to prove his theory, Paul first takes his team south to Anwal. That's a small Moroccan town at the edge of the Sahara Desert. Because some fossils were discovered near here about 40 years ago, Paul has high hopes for what might be buried in this part of the world. This is the most ambitious expedition ever mounted in this area, and the whole town's talking about it. After checking into Hotel Pup Tent, it's time to dig. Behind this bridge you see a really long sort of tongue coming down. So maybe that's this bridge here? Yeah, that's probably that. Okay. With Han's directions to guide them, the search is on. More and more there's evidence that uh, there are fossils here in Morocco. We know that there are fossils here. But actually getting there with the right team, with the right amount of energy, and the ability to cover large areas uh, of this part of the Sahara is the grand trick. Now Paul has a pretty good track record when it comes to bone hunting, but he'll still have his work cut out for him on this dig. Hey, you found something already. Looks like prospecting for fossils is a piece of cake. I think that prospecting for fossils is um, a lot of hard work. <laughs> you can uh, uh, look here in the fossils there and you don't see it. That part's luck. Yeah. But that you're looking in this area in the first place has to do with the fact that you've interpreted a map correctly, that you've gone to the outcrop, saw a bad one, went to a good one. You make hundreds of decisions like this in the course of a field season. And mm -hmm. if you have some idea of what the rocks are telling you about the environment, then you, you stand choose. a much better chance of mm. finding fossils. It's like it has more to do with um, understanding rocks. <laughs> and what do the rocks tell you? Nothing, if you keep hitting them on the head like that. Well, that's the only way to find out if they're hiding any fossils. One of the fastest ways to tell what kind of sediment you're dealing with is just to taste it and chew it for a while. Because with just one or two bites, you can determine how much grit is in a piece of sediment. It's a little gritty, but no, very, very, very slight. Just a touch, touch of sand. Yeah. Snacking on dirt told Hans and Paul two things. Number one, that this area used to be a saltwater lake, which means very few dino fossils will be found. And number two? Dirt tastes better with a little salt. So after seven days in Anwa with nothing to show for all their work but a mouthful of dirt, they packed up the trucks and headed even further south to a region called the Kem Kem. Now this is real desert. Very few people live out here, and guess why? It can get as hot as 130 degrees and no air conditioning. There's a, a certain aura about the Sahara uh, because there's so little known. And a vastness uh, that you get when you enter the Sahara, which you don't get anywhere else in the world. Uh, it's awe-inspiring when you're in the field and you realize how much of this land has never been walked before. What about those footprints right there? That's just a mirage, Sam. The desert can play tricks on your mind. Whoa, you're freaking me out. But Paul dreams of finding the real thing. Fossil evidence of how African dinosaurs lived and died in the mysterious Mesozoic. It looks like Paul and his friends are in a hurry to find out. They've got the pedal to the metal. And they're gonna put the hammer down. 10-4. And the dig continues. Let's get back to the desert. Sam. I'm sorry, but I cannot take you seriously with that fake mustache. Fake? What makes you think this is fake? <laughs> because, I'll show you. That's what a real mustache looks like. All right, you got me. But I was just paying tribute to my man, Paul Serino. Well, your man and his team are starting to look a little bit tired. Can you blame them? So far, the more they search, the less they find. That's got my man, Paul, pretty bummed out. 
There's such a lore about this part of the Sahara with the early finds. I thought that bone might be more plentiful, it would be easier to find fossils than it actually was. And uh, after about two weeks of being in the desert, we understood the odds we were against, which was that it was going to be quite difficult to actually walk out of here with uh, some new dinosaurs. Things are starting to look pretty bleak. But while there's still time, this crew isn't about to give up. So night after night, they go back to their campsite empty-handed. Pretty harsh. But they don't lose hope. Out in the desert, it's all about positive attitude. And it can pay off big time. In fact, the next morning, Gabe turned a potential fashion nightmare into the find of a lifetime. Well, in the morning, it started out on a wrong foot, literally. Uh, one of my boots had been plunged into water, and so we opened up the truck, and it was time to go prospecting. And I decided to prospect in one boot and one sandal and had spent the day with a little bit of trepidation on every rock. It came time to go back for lunch, and I said to Jeff, I said, oh, I'll, I'll meet you at the truck, so I'm going to go the long way around. It's easier to get down. Gabrielle, uh, all of a sudden, uh, didn't come back for lunch on time, and we got very worried. On the way, I stumbled over a, an incredible find. <laughs> At the time, I didn't, I didn't know it. And uh, we went running out to find a finder after uh, almost an hour had passed. I saw one bone, I saw another bone, and I was trying to get them, and I knew I was going to be late for lunch. And we eventually did find her, and she came down with these strange bones. And they were running around calling my name, going, Gabe, and I'm like, I'm fine, I'm, I'm okay. Everyone was pumped. Finally, some serious bones. And they started uncovering Gabe's lucky discovery right away. After five days of careful digging, they finally uncovered all of the bones. But now, before they could move them, they had to pack them. This is one of my favorite parts. They get these giant rolls of tin foil and wrap the fossils in it. The world's oldest leftovers. Dinosaur, the other white meat. They've got to make sure that it's really tight, like Jeff is doing here so that no fragments can be knocked loose. Next, the team wraps the bones in these burlap strips that have been dipped in plaster. When it dries, it's like an outer shell that'll protect them on the long road back to the lab. It's like the cast I got when I broke my arm in second grade. Yeah, except that your bone was only eight years old. Hey, a cast is a cast, man. Anyway, with everything wrapped, they loaded up the fossils and headed back to camp. And that's where Paul realized just what they'd found and it seriously freaked them out. It was midnight of that long, long day that I went into the uh, shelter that we had uh, the bones stored in, and I picked up the first fragment and put it right into place on one of the other pieces. Uh, as the hours passed, my eyes were just really, I, I was, I just couldn't believe what was being assembled in front of me. Four in the morning, Paul came over to my cot and was like, Gabe, Gabe. I was tears in my eyes, I said, you, you don't know what we've discovered. I discovered something absolutely incredible. Hi. You're never going to believe it. What we were seeing was a map of a single skeleton, a very strange one. I had a very important announcement to the crew. I assembled them all. I started telling them that they were the greatest crew because they put up with uh, an incredible uh, season. Not a single one of them was down. And I said, you, you know, I started crying in front of them. And I said, you will not believe what we have begun to discover here. Uh, come and see. What they saw was a whole new kind of predator. It looked like a weird mini version of Scarius Maximus, better known as T-Rex. Nothing like it had ever been found before. Which was more than enough reason to celebrate with some good old-fashioned desert football. Hey, I thought these guys were tired. No better way to work up a big appetite. Dinner is served. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit of spice. Yeah. 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 Work of magic in the field. But before they turn in, there's one last chore to do. They have to replenish their water supply at the local well. Good move. They'll need it tomorrow when they're back in the scorching hot desert, hoping that their good luck continues. Now that they made the big find, they can all go home happy now. Uh, not so fast. They still have a few more days and they're going to make the most of them. Let's check it out. The dig's almost over and Paul's on the lookout for one last find. We still had uh, a couple days left in the field. We moved to one of the last areas we had to look. This time I was the lucky one and it was totally unpredictable. 
I saw an area of outcrop. I walked towards it. And I walked over and I saw in front of me a pile of bones, fragments. I picked this thing up, looked at the upside down side, and my eyes popped out of my head. Here we had the back end of a theropod skull, beautifully preserved, flesh-eating carnivorous dinosaur. Of course, always fingers crossed, I mean, maybe this was part of something else that was just above somewhere, but it was quite sheer, and I missed it the first time. And I circled around again, and that's when I saw, I looked up, and I saw on a pillar of rock the rest of the, the brain case and the skull going into the side of this cliff, and it was a sheer cliff, and it was sort of like a little statue sitting up there and again this was too much i mean <laughs> wow this cheekbone is really huge so this would be the nose area here yeah yeah this right this is the left so it's been put over there so here's the other nostril right here yeah i'm digging in the nose right now look at this have you guys seen the teeth this is incredible one two three there's a replacing tooth here four five six seven eight nine ten eleven we got the whole jaw this would have been one mean creature Jaws. If I ever imagined myself alive with one of the creatures that we're excavating, I always imagine myself hiding, but I'd, I'd give an arm to see the thing alive. It would be absolutely fantastic, um, even if that arm was taken by the dinosaur. <laughs> and there's no doubt this guy could do the job. Grabbing his arm with those teeth, tearing it off, having at him with those claws. Back at the dig site, they plaster up the bones and roll them out of there. Okay, I see where it's coming. Okay. See if you can right. slide it. On the count of three. One, two, easy go. Okay, you slide, slide the bottom. Pull yourself up. There we go. Okay. Very good. Woo. That's some pretty impressive teamwork, but the hardest part is coming up. Okay, now. One, two, three. You can't imagine a better team. A team that sticks together, has fun, works incredibly hard, with shredded boots, patched pants. They're ready to, to go the extra uh, 10 miles uh, in the heat, and, I, and I'm really thrilled to be uh, a part of it. It's the last day of the dig, and what a way to wrap things up. They found some great clues to the mysteries of the Sahara, but their detective work is only beginning. Yeah, I know what you mean. How are they going to get that thing into the back of that truck? Hey, all right, they did it. I guess it wasn't so tough. Actually, I was talking about getting the fossils back to the lab and trying to figure out just what kind of beast they'd found. <laughs> oh, sure, there's all that lab work, but there's something even more important waiting for them back home. And what would that be? Some real food for a change. Really good, I think, omelet. Hot chicken wings. Yeah. Juicy steak, some corn on the cob. That would be good. Some mashed potatoes. Yeah, definitely steak and milk. That would be my bet. That would be my guess. Chocolate milkshake with whipped cream. Well, believe it or not, it's finally time to head home. They've got a lot of lab work to do, but at least it'll be air conditioned. Looks like they made some friends while they were in Africa. Of course they did. They're not exactly your average tourists, but they did get some of the best souvenirs in history. And even after the fossils themselves are in a museum somewhere, Paul and his rock group will always have the memories of their African tour. It's terribly thrilling to pull off these adventures in Africa. When you meet the challenge with a young group like this and succeed, it's one of those rare moments in life, and life is short. We're going to be back, I hope, next year, uh, trying to do it again. And uh, I think we all leave feeling that it's one of the greatest moments of our lives. Not too shabby, they took on the Sahara and they kicked some serious desert butt. Go ho, boneheads. Teamwork, sweat, and elbow grease. That's the recipe for success. It may not sound too appetizing, but it works. Yeah, and let's not forget that classic one boot, one sandal search strategy. True, sometimes it takes more than skill and a cute mustache to find fossils. No matter how great your team is or how much you prepare, you still need luck on your side. Yeah, like when I tripped and found the shovel. Probably not as important a discovery as Paul's, but I see your point. <laughs>